Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, <coughs> welcome back to this uh, 13th lecture in the course on the psychology of language. Now, in the last lecture we are looking at sentences and some aspects of sentences which are psychological in nature. Today what we will do is we will complete uh, that section by looking at how sentence comprehension takes place and how syntactic rules. Uh, which is sentence forming rules are uh, learned uh, by both adults and uh, young people. Now, as we have been doing <laughs> in all the past lectures, what I am going to do is uh, take a few moments here and travel back in time and uh, make the context or give you the context in where this lecture stands. So, we started this course by uh, discussing how or why language is used, what is the need of language and for that we needed to define uh, the basic difference between langu language and communication. Now, communication is a form of language, but in communication a number of ideas cannot be expressed and so for the study of language we started looking at something called the animal communication system, which is the most basic form of uh, language. So, there we saw why animals communicate and how do they communicate, what are the methods of their communication. We looked at things like calls from vervet monkeys, we looked at han, uh, honey bee uh, wangle dances and other aspects which basically explain uh, the idea of animal communication system. And further to that we took a look at what the human language system is all about and compared between the animal and human language system. So, how the human language system has developed over a period of time. Uh, we defined briefly that the human language system starts with phonology or basic phones and how it progresses through the morpheme level to the word level to the sentence level to the level of discourse and uh, uh, further on. So, basically this, this structure of how the language is based or how the human language system is made and is used is that is what we were discussing. Further on we were uh, we focused a little bit on to uh, the idea of how language evolved. So, the evolution of language is what we were concerned in and so we uh, looked at uh, the idea of how language would have evolved out of Africa and uh, the idea of uh, how uh, the recessive uh, or recession in language is used. We also looked at uh, the idea of uh, uh, how our ancient uh, and uh, grandparents, grand great grandparents, they developed the language. And towards the end of this section, we looked at something called evidences to the fact that how language would have developed. And so, we looked at things like uh, uh, the uh, use of proto language system, the use of pit gains and other uh, basic evidences which point out to the fact that how language would have developed. Uh, we also looked at the evidence from baby talk and how babies express their ideas and so this, these provides us enough evidences to the fact that how language would have developed. So, that was what we were doing in the first chapter, we were just looking around and poking around. Uh, trying to understand what is language first of all and so how animal language systems and human language system uh, develop and a little bit of history. Now, if uh, we have to progress further, we needed to explain what kind of research is done in language and how research is done in language. So, the next section uh, that we did was on looking at research in language. So, what aspects of research in language are there? So, we looked at the science, uh, science of language. We looked at the scientific method which is used for doing research in language. We looked at uh, this method in terms of the theory, in terms of the hip hypothesis, in terms of how this hypothesis is tested by data, what kind of designs are used and all those kinds of uh, uh, 
experimental procedures which are used for doing research in language. We took the example of uh, the evolution of uh, N400 and how this fits into the whole, uh, uh, whole idea of how language research is done. We then focused on experimental designs, what kind of designs can be used in language. So, we looked at both the uh, between subject and within subject designs and we also looked at some more designs which can be used in doing research on languages. Further to that, we looked at some behavioral techniques that are used for uh, doing language research, but particularly we were interested in uh, measuring uh, re, uh, re, uh, the accuracy and reaction time, latency and, uh, uh, latency and accuracy and how this latency and accuracy give us an idea about the language systems of the brain or how the brain produces language or uh, language processing and those kind of facts. And towards the end of this section, we focused on something called the language on the brain. So, we were looking at what kind of techniques are used for doing language studies, how the brain can be studied by newer techniques like the EEG, fMRI and MRI and how these techniques helps us in understanding language. We also looked at certain brain areas which are dedicated to language for example, the Wernicke and the Broca area and so that is what we were doing up till the second section. Now, once we had the tools to do uh, research in language and once we had uh, gotten past the fact that how language has developed, we moved on to the section of understanding how speech is produced. So, we were interested in looking at how speech production happens because the next step was to understand how language is produced and how language is perceived. So, these two sections of perception of language and, and production of language is, is what comprised of the second section. Now, in uh, the second section, we started off by looking at how uh, the speech is perceived, what is the way in which speech is perceived and so started off by looking at auditory perception, how does auditory perception uh, takes place. So, we looked at facts like what are the fun uh, fundamental frequency and what are overtones things like how the uh, speech is in the form of wave and how this wave is measured, what are the measures of this wave, uh, what are amplitude, what are frequencies and those kind of things are that we were look uh, interested in. We also were interested in looking at the look and feel of sound of how does sound actually uh, appears both in the physical and the psychological domains. Now, from there we looked at in, uh, the or we focused on to the idea of how the, uh, the ear is uh, made or the conceptualization of the human ear which basically helps us in, uh, in perceiving sound or listening to sound. Then we moved towards the idea of what the speech stream consists of. So, basically what is speech made up of and there we were looking at uh, with the help of a spectrogram, we looked at how speech is continuous in nature and uh, what is the nature of this speech stream. So, we were focusing on things like phonation, we are focusing on things like prosody which is fluctuations in uh, the speech stream, we were looking at the formants and uh, the idea of formants and sorents and uh, in within the sorents we have the fricatives and the plosives. So, we are looking at all those kinds of qualities of uh, this speech stream or these peculiarities of speech stream and, uh, and other uh, uh, necessary characteristics of the speech stream. Then once we were done with this, we moved on to looking at uh, the uh, how this speech is developed in uh, uh, in infants. So, what is the process of development in speech in, 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 in infants and so we started looking at how the language learning happens in the womb. So, we looked at all those factors, all those evidences which are out there which help us understanding that how the language le learning happens in infants or within the womb. Now, if, uh, we also looked at how uh, newborns perceive language and what role does baby talk have in the perception of speech. So, what evidences can baby talk provide us in how speech is perceived or uh, by or how speech perception is developed in the new, uh, in the infants and neonates. Now, after once, once we were uh, once we had uh, been able to establish the facts of how the speech stream is uh, deciphered and and uh, understood by infants and uh, how they use this, we moved on further to understanding 
uh, focusing on the theories of speech perception that is where what we were ending in. So, in the theories of speech perception we basically looked at the motor theory which, bas which basically says that there are articulators motor movements uh, basically uh, in addition to the movement that is happening in, in, in terms of speech hearing and so they coordinate together to make speech. So, we looked at the idea of the motor theory, the general auditory framework and the idea of direct realism which are the three theories which have been given in speech perceptions. Now, once we have been cleared off all this, we the next thing that we wanted to look is uh, how speech is produced because we have covered up till now uh, at the, up to the point that how speech is perceived or how one hears speech. And so, we jumped on to the idea of how speech is produced. In that we started off that section we started off by looking at the idea of the vocal tract in the production of speech. So, how the vocal tract looks like, the uh, vocal box looks like and how speech is produced and how this spe <coughs> speech production basically is then transferred to different people who are hearing the speech. Next we are looking uh, we looked at speech areas in the brain. So, various speech areas and how they are combined. So, the Wernicke and Broca area, what is the relation between them, how different connections from the Broca and the, and the um, Wernicke area are there and what do they mean. Next to that we looked at models of speech produ uh, production. So, various models of speech production uh, uh, like the feed forward and feedback control model, the auditory suppression during speech model, the DIVA model and the dual stream model which ba basically explain how speech is formed or speech is produced. And lastly, we looked at the development of speech production. So, how speech production develops in uh, infants. So, there we looked at the cases of babbling, the frame then content model, the social aspects of babbling and how all of these explain the perception of speech uh, uh, or the production, the development of uh, production of speech in the smaller children. Now, once we are clear off from these two aspects of looking into the history and science of uh, the um, uh, uh, language or speech, we started focusing on more bigger issues and that is where we dedicated a three lecture section on words because words are central to explaining uh, any idea, to explaining any form of uh, 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 idea within the language. So, we started off by looking at uh, this the section on words by looking at the anatomy of a word. So, what does a word look like? What is the anatomy of a word? And so, there we looked at uh, how words are labeled <coughs> used as label for uh, different concepts and what are the different forms of words which are there. So, we focused on the content word and functional words, suffixes, prefixes, shift shifters, the phonology of word forms and so on and so forth. So, we, we basically focused on what are words and what is the anatomy of the word. Now, once we, we had an idea of what words are or what is the anatomy of a word, we jumped on to looking at how words are basically learned. So, the ways in which the words are learned by people around us and uh, there we looked at things like how uh, children of different ages learn different words and how there is a initially there is a uh, slow down progress, but then there is a growth spurt in word learning and then it falls off after some, after 6 months. So, we looked at those evidences, we looked at how mapping fast and slow mapping actually help us in uh, learning of words and uh, we also looked at how neighborhood density and in the in the semantic networks help us in learning different words. Now, once we had looked at how words are learned, the obvious question that remain is to look at how words are basically stored. So, what is the way in which words are stored into the uh, the brain and there we looked at two different formats or basically more different formats and so we looked at that most words are not only stored in terms of the pronunciation which is the phonological form. We also looked at that words are stored into the ex, uh, into the mental lexicon in terms of the semantic forms also. So, basically we looked at how the words are stored into uh, the mental lexicon. We also looked at how the cortical organization of this mental lexicon is. So, basically how this mental, uh, uh, this, uh, mental lexicon is arranged in the, uh, the cerebral cortex and we looked at uh, some models of basically explaining it. And lastly, 
once we, we know how words are saved, we were interested in looking at how words are retrieved and so that was the last thing that we wanted to do. So, we, we looked at word retrieval model. So, we focused on recognition and recall which are the two methods of retrieval of any information from memory. So, we looked, we started out by looking at how spoken words are recognized and then we looked at how spoken word are produced and the, uh, we also looked at several models of word, uh, word retrieval, uh, one being the leaflet free forward model the other being the Dell interactive model and a third model being the uh, so the the two models basically the uh, the feed forward model and the Dell interactive model and how these models explain that how words are retrieved from long term memory. So, once we were done with words in the last lecture which is lecture number 12, we started off by looking at sentences. Now, why are sentences necessary? Sentences are necessary because uh, uh, we can think without words and sentences, but for expressing our thoughts to people, we need words and these words have to be arranged in certain sequences to form sentences because it is sentences that express us in, uh, in, in, trans, in, in transferring ideas between people. So, we started off the section by looking at the structure of a sentence. So, sent how does the sentence structure look like and there we looked at that how uh, the various parts of a sentence are amalgamated. So, basically uh, what are the various parts of a sentence, the subject, verb, object and we looked at how English treats it, this this kind of an organization, the SVO format. We also look at how uh, the, the agent and patient which is the which are the, the two actors and uh, the idea of the verb which explains the event which is connecting the agent patient, how they are uh, assigned the text, uh, the uh, the thematic role and how this thematic role assignment and the idea of the subject object verb, they combine together to give us an idea of what sentence structure looks like. Uh, so, uh, we looked at how sentences can be broken down into its clauses, into its uh, various um, uh, subsidiaries, into, uh, uh, into the SVO format and so on and so forth. So, we looked at uh, the uh, uh, syntactic structures in which a language can be processed. Further to that, we also looked at how complexities are added into the sentences and there we looked at how cleft sentences are used for adding complexities. We also looked at how a relative clause can be used for uh, maintaining complexity in sentences and we also looked at the, uh, the way how a dative construction can be uh, used for making complexities. Lastly, we also looked at how the agreement uh, is, uh, is necessary for maintaining or agreement provides the complexity of uh, sentences or the uh, agreement uh, adds on to the complexity of sentences. Once you are clear of that, we looked at comprehending sentences, so how sentences are comprehended or understood and there we were uh, looking at the idea of uh, ambiguous sentences which are called the uh, garden path sentences because garden path sentences uh, sort of gives us an idea of how sentences are formed or how sentences are comprehended. And from there we uh, come to know that there is a two stage model of uh, sentence comprehension, one at the semantic level, the other is the uh, syntactic level. Then we looked at the idea of uh, heuristics which are used in sentence co uh, comprehension and we looked at the late closure heurist which is a syntactic parsing strategy that continues to add new words to the current structure until it is uh, the un un until uh, uh, there is sufficient evidence that new structure begins. And so we also looked at uh, the idea of minimal attachment which is another heurist which is used for maintaining or, or, or comprehending sentences. We also looked at how priming and anticipation can help us in and comprehending sentences. And uh, finally, we looked at the idea of Broca area which are the new evidences of the idea of Broca area which says that Broca's area is not only uh, responsible for uh, the, the syntactic structure of sentences, but Broca area in a newer light with newer researches is basically a way station, it is kind of a working memory uh, system which uh, integrates the semantic and syntactic inputs of uh, sentence uh, of sentences and uh, it, it how it processes these two input and, and, and how and how Broca area what role does Broca area play in this kind of a uh, this kind of a uh, process, sentence processing. What we are going to do today is we look at how sentences are produced and we will also look at uh, not only we look at how sentences are produced, we will also be uh, focusing on how do we learn syntactic structures. So, the two main aims of today's lecture is to focus on the production of sentences and the 
uh, and the uh, learning of syntactic structures. So, basically it is uh, it's believed that sentences are produced, most uh, sentences uh, they are processed through two streams, one is called the ventral stream and the other is called the, uh, the uh, dorsal stream. Now, just like as we saw in word production and uh, uh, how words are produced, we believe that word production follows a three level structure. Now, sentences are nothing more than just words are in, in the right syntax. So, uh, a look at the word production of how words are produced will give us some idea of how sentences are produced. Now, word production starts has a three stage, uh, uh, three step processing. The first sta stage is uh, th at the semantic level where uh, the concept uh, when a word, uh, when a thought is induced, the concept or the uh, 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 that explain that particular thought is uh, first in initiated. From there, uh, the mental lexicon is searched uh, for the lemma of that concept, which is the lemma is the abstract form of that concept and all kind of um, endings, uh, morphological and syntactic endings which are added to this lemma is in the second stage. And at the third stage, uh, these lemma is then sent to uh, the phonological level where a pronunciation of the word is made and this is how the uh, words are produced. Now, if you extend this concept to a sentence production, we uh, basically uh, uh, come to the idea that what uh, sent, uh, sent, uh, as we produce sentences, information tends to flow both in the vertical and the horizontal direction. Now, the vertical dimension represents the flow of information from conceptual to phonological level. So, sentence production goes through both a, a vertical uh, information flow as well as a horizontal inf information flow. And in the vertical information flow, what happens is uh, the uh, information flows from conceptual nodes to the phonological nodes. So, basically that is how the, uh, the, the words are processed similar to how word production is. But at the horizontal level, at the horizontal <coughs> information flow, uh, the uh, information or uh, at uh, the horizontal information flow follows some models and these models can act both in serial or in parallel ways. So, uh, sentence production uh, models uh, are ba uh, follow basically a serial order, a serial model or a, uh, or, or a parallel model. Now, what do I mean by this? A serial model is a model in which all processing uh, of the uh, of, of the sentence happen at one step and it needs to be completed before moving to the next step. So, in, in the serial model what happens is the whole sentence, the whole uh, idea <coughs> of looking at the, the uh, conceptual level of uh, uh, thought, then moving it to the lemma level where uh, the, the abstract form of that word is extracted and then moving up to the phonological level where the pronunciation of that particular word, all these happens at the same time. So, one sentence at a time kind of a, uh, so one word at a time kind of a processing. Now, in serial order what happens in, in, in serial processing what happens is one word at a time is, is processed and that is how the sentence is processed the serial order or serial model says that. So, basically what the serial model says is all processing uh, at one step needs to be completed before mo moving to the next step and so this is how the sentence processing happens in the serial model. But then we also have something called the parallel model and what does the, so basically in the serial model what happens is a strictly serial model require the speaker to go from a concept activation uh, through lemma selection to the phonological encoding of the, uh, of uh, in any sentence before it can move from one concept to the next concept. That is what I said, so word by word kind of a processing. We also have a parallel model of processing <coughs> and in the parallel model of processing what really happens is the processing is happening uh, at one step occur simultaneously with the same processing at the other step. And so, here hap what happens is all words are processed at the same time with the sentence and so all processing steps are taking place at the same time. So, there is a parallel movement. Now, it is a model in which the processing of one step occurs simultaneously with the same processing of the other steps. In a strictly parallel model, uh, the concepts would be activated at the same time. Uh, and after that the three uh, the uh, lemmas will be activated at the same time of all the words in a sentences and the phonological structure will also be activated at the same time of all the words in a sentence. But then what researchers would have found or researchers have found is that uh, 
sentence processing neither follows the ser strictly serial order nor a strictly parallel order. But what happens is that sentence processing generally follows something called an incremental model. So, processing at one step is underway while processing the next step begins. So, most scientific evidences suggest that uh, the incremental model of sentence processing is used. That is we start a sentence before we have planned uh, uh, all the way to the end. Now, this is the parallel model. Now, we look at this particular sentence Indiana Jones is chasing the Nazis. This is the sentence that we, uh, we have and what we want to see is how this is processed, how this sentence should be processed by using the parallel serial and incremental model and this is the parallel model example. So, in the parallel model, uh, model example what will happen is Indiana Jones which is the subject, chase which is the verb and Nazi which is the object they all are processed at the same time. So, in what will happen is at step 1 the concept of Indiana Jones, the concept of chase and the concept of Nazi will be excited and then following that the lemma, the abstract form of this word will be selected from the mental lexicon. So, Indiana Jones this is the lexicon, chase is plus ing that is the mental lexicon and Nazi is the this is the mental lexicon and so after that we will have the phonological level, at the phonological level the pronunciation of Indiana Jones is chasing the Nazis that is how it is uh, going to be processed if it is happening at the parallel. So, all three stages from right from the conceptual level where the concept is thought about to the, the uh, lemma level where the, uh, the most abstract form of that word is selected and then add uh, new structures or new syntaxes and uh, uh, morphological endings are added to the word uh, uh, from there to the phonological level uh, each of this step happens one by one. Now, if we use an incremental model the same sentences Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones chase the Nazi will be happening in this way. So, first the Indiana Jones will be processed and while the Indiana Jones is being processed at the three level which is the semantic level or the conceptual level, the lemma level and the phonological level what will happen is so maybe the conceptual and lemma level of Indiana Jones has finished and chase starts getting processed at the conceptual level and by the time this chase has, start, has started processing at the lemma level the phonological level processing of Indiana Jones is finished and what will happen is at this point of time the conceptual level of Nazi would have started and by the time we have the phonological level of this sentence being finished, we have the lemma level being excited and the phonological level being start. So, what happens is one sentence, one word of a sentence or couple of words of a sentence is being processed at three levels and they are processed in incremental way. So, by the time the Indiana Jones, the, the lemma level of Indiana Jones is activated, the conceptual level of the second uh, the verb in the sentence has already been started. So, this is called the incremental level. Now, in this uh, in the serial model what would happen is one by one. So, in what will happen is Indiana Jones the three levels the conceptual level, the lemma level and the phonological level of Indiana Jones would first finish and then only chase <coughs> processing of chase will start and then the conceptual level processing the lemma level processing and the phonological processing or uh, phonological level processing of chase would have end and then the Nazi <coughs> would get processed at the three levels. So, once this step is finished only then this step starts working and then this step is working. So, serial model. So, there are the three uh, models of processing which are um, uh, suggested for uh, 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 the processing of sentences. Giving, given the fact that we use incremental model of processing how far do we plan ahead, planning scope. So, how far do we think or uh, do we let ourselves think uh, before we uh, end processing of the first sentences. So, given that spoken sentence production is incremental, psycholinguist disagrees on how far ahead we plan. Now, uh, research experiments suggest that we plan sentences one content uh, word at a time while other points to the phrase or clause level. So, basically there are three views. One view says that we plan at the level of content, the other says we plan at the level of clause. So, uh, the clause by clause processing and then we have something called the phrase by phrase processing. So, these are the three kinds of processing which is there. So, data is inconsistent. <laughs> what data would suggest is that either we process through a content word kind of a thing or we, con uh, we process ahead, we plan ahead at the level of phrase or at the level of clause.
So, uh, how do we explain this in, uh, inconsistency? So, the data points in all direction regarding how far advance is. Uh, in advance, we plan our sentences. Uh, and different since different researchers use different kind of procedures for testing this uh, or different experimental uh, design for planning this kind of, a, of a, uh, for investigating this planning scope there is no consistency on how far do we uh, plan so exper uh, this inconsistency in data is explained by experimental procedures may bias the planning scope so why is this uh, why is this inconsistency of how far we plan one is because the experimental procedures may bias different ex experiments use different experimental procedures and so that will be one other reason also planning scope may vary according to the processing demands now some sentences are easy for example if you are doing if you are giving a lecture <coughs> in this case the cognitive demands are very high and so we plan ahead in a different way or we plan ahead sentences in different way. But if we are chit chatting then planning uh, uh, may not be planning uh, ahead is an automatic process or sometimes there is no planning at all. And so, it depends upon the, the uh, processing demand and third is the different level of processing may have different planning uh, scopes. The, so, it could also be possible that different levels of processing may have different planning scopes. So, the same sentences at some uh, level uh, would have a clause by clause uh, uh, planning at the other level it would have a phrase by phrase planning. Now, the sc scope of planning at the conceptual level may be the clause while the scope of the planning at the lexical level may be at the phrase or the content word and so what this basically says is that at the conceptual level the planning happens at the clause level. So, uh, planning at noun clause, verb clause, uh, various clauses which are there and uh, at uh, while at the lexical level the planning happens at the phrase level. So, we have the noun phrase, the verb phrase or uh, the participle phrase or it is done at the level of content words. How many content words are there? And this is by clause. So, different different clauses are there subject clause, object clause and that kind of a uh, 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 planning could have ex, uh, would have explained. So, basically what it says is that uh, different levels of processing may have different planning scope. Now, also hierarchical structure in advanced planning makes general plan the highest level risk-free scope for planning at the lower level. So, hierarchical structure in, in, in so other processes that the brain may engage in uh, uh, in, in uh, planning ahead uh, the scope of a sentence could work in, in terms of motor performances or uh, or by looking at this, this is so hierarchical structure in advanced planning is an actually a computer based program and so what it says is that we make general plan at the highest level restrict scope of planning at the lower level. So, once we make a general plan at the highest level this reduces the scope of planning at the lowest level. So, whatever we plan at the higher level that decides how the planning for the lower levels will actually induce. Now, the visual attention has its own say or it gives us an own idea about uh, gives us an idea of how sentences processed. Now, visual attention uh, uh, we have seen before that how uh, researchers use the visual word paradigm and how this visual word paradigm with eye tracking to examine uh, to examine how listeners were comprehending spoken sentences. Now, this eye movement that people do in visual paradigm that gives us some idea of what kind of processing is happening at the sent at, at which word in, in, in a sentence. So, basically visual attention proceeds sequentially as a series of <coughs> if we are able to see how people are reading a word and if we do an eye tracking that will tell you how people are uh, 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 producing this sentence or how people are comprehending this sentence. So, basically that gives us a idea of how sentence is being produced or how sentence is being comprehended. Now, generally speaking most sentences has subject as the focus of attention. Now, it is it's believed that visual attention plays an important role in sentence production and in fact, uh, uh, the sentence production is visual attention this that uh, there is some structural parallels. Now, when we open our eyes a, a wide visual scene appears before it, but we cannot take in the whole scene at once. Now, instead we move from one one uh, uh, word to the other word through fixation and circuits and this fixation and circuits actually define uh, how sentences are uh, processed or how sentences are produced. Now, generally speaking visual uh, visual attention proceeds through something called a sequential sent, uh, fashion, visual at attention proceeds through a sequential fashion as the sentences do. So, basically what part 
or which word content word do we make the subject of a sentence that is explained uh, by the visual attention studies. And so, visual attention studies or eye uh, the, uh, the eye tracking studies of uh, visual attention task give us an idea of how sub the subject who is reading a sentence decides what should be the subject of that particular sentence. We also use something called differential priming and so what is referential priming? Participants first shown one item before a full display is presented and in picture description task prime usually selected as the subject. So, in differential priming what really happens is that it is an experimental procedure in which uh, the participant is first shown only one of the items of the visual display before the full display is pr uh, presented. Now, referential, uh, referential priming they tend to direct the participants attention uh, towards uh, the prime the primed item in a visual uh, display and in picture description task the primed item tends to be selected as the subject of the sentence. So, basically ref uh, referential priming gives us an idea of how the subject of a sentence is uh, is basically selected. Now, a number of other factors can also inf in influence subject selection. So, how in a sentence a subject is selected? It is believed that humans are generally the subject in most sentences and animate uh, uh, items or animate objects are selected as sen uh, sentences. Also, we have something called scrambling which is a syntactic process of putting the object before the subject. So, syntactic process of putting the object before the subject and what does scrambling do? It also explains how the agent is selected as the subject. So, scrambling is, is, a, is a phenomena which basically says or which basically explains how the subject is explained uh, or how the subject is uh, selected in a sentence. And so, basically what it does is this kind of visual priming studies or visual attention studies tells you how sentences are produced or how sentences are comprehended that is that is what uh, the idea is. Now, if I have an active voice Indiana Jones is chasing the Nazis, the passive voice is the Nazis are being chased by the Indiana Jones. Now, uh, basically the two sentences now what has run is in this case the Nazis has uh, the Nazis become th which was the object now becomes the subject in English language. But what Russians tend to do is they use scrambling. Now, what is scrambling? As I said, it is it is the process syntactic process of putting the object before the subject. And so, since Russian nouns have uh, uh, they uh, they are marked for their role as uh, as a subject or an object. So, it does not really matter from the word order does not matter for uh, the Russians. And so, if the Russians are rewriting the sentences, the, na the, the in Indiana Jones or Nazis will always be the subject or even if you change the word order that uh, the subject order is fixed. And so, in if you use scrambling, Russians use scrambling, the sentences that they make is that the Nazis Indiana Jones is chasing. So, this kind of a thing is possible in Russian, but not in English language. So, basically scrambling is the process of uh, is is a syntactic process of putting the object before the subject and still making a sentence. And why does it work? It works because in Russian word order is not important. <laughs> now, sentence production in the, in the brain. Now, brain imaging studies of sentence production are difficult to set up for a number of reasons, but a few have been performed so far and yielded results that are consistent with the current model of language processing. So, what is the current model? The temporal lobe is implicated as a lexical selection and the left inferior frontal gyrus which is the Broca area is implicated as for syntactic priming. So, there is a dual stream model of uh, sentence production in the brain. The ventral stream is what stream uh, through which the temporal lobe the lexicon selection happens and then we have the dorsal stream by the house stream uh, through parietal and the frontal lobe where the syntactic processing happens. Now, uh, syntactic priming can uh, also lead to a particular structure being processed more easily. And so, sentence production, uh, the syntactic priming can actually help in producing sentences or uh, explain understanding sentences faster. So, prior experience can bias speakers towards using particular structure. Now, if we do syntactic priming, this will help us in, uh, in, in uh, uh, biasing subjects to using particular structures. Now, after hearing several passive sentences, participants are more likely to produce uh, passive sentences in picture description task. And so, this basically says that sentence production is affected by syntactic priming. Sim similarly, we have something called repeta uh, repetition uh, suppression. Uh, what is repetition suppression? Uh, it is a reduction in the brain activity when syntactic prime sentences are processed. So, reduction in the brain activity when syntactically prime sentences are processed. So, when uh, uh, you, you saw a prime, a syntactic prime before the actual uh, uh, word uh, 
or actual sentence is to be processed, it is processed in an easy manner and this leads to uh, the lowering of the brain activity or the, it makes the processing of the sentence easy. So, basically it is repeat, repetition suppression is that kind of a thing. So, once we are clear of what sentence production and comprehension is all about. Let us now look at how do we learn syntactic structures. So, what is the way in which syntactic structures are learned? Now, we come in the infants and uh, or we as human beings, we come into the world already familiar with the pitch and rhythm patterns of the mother language. So, we, we are very familiar with the mother's language and we are very familiar with the intonations and the pitch and rhythm of our mother's language. Now, these prosodic cues, these intonational cues or these uh, cues of uh, up and down tone uh, serve as the key for the infant to crack the code or syntax. So, basically how does in, uh, infant learn the syntactic code? By focusing himself onto the prosodic cues from the mother's speech sound. So, basically then how does the infant uh, learn this sy uh, syntactic structure, the structure of how a sentence should be or where uh, the, the sentences are bro should be broken, so that meaning can be extracted out of it. So, adult speech are essentially uh, an uh, uh, adult speech which are essential and those adult speech which are especially directed towards the infant, they flow in arcs of rising and falling pitch that stretch across groups of words. So, when we talk to infants, the pitch goes up and down or the, it, it keeps on waving up and down and these up and down basically call in uh, uh, the in uh, the in intonation these up and down that we do in our wise modulation while talking to infants are basically called an uh, intonation now each intonational phase boundary this up and down the boundary between these up and down are called intonational phase boundary is a prosodic cue uh, consisting of change in pitch usually downward and lengthening of the final syllable that signals the end of a syntactic phrase. So, what we tend to do is we tend to use this in, uh, intonational phase boundaries when talking to infants and these intonational phase boundaries are the ones that the infants actually use to understand the syntactic structures. Now, we use prosodic cues signaling end of syntactic phrases and drop in pitch lending on the final syllable to actually explain or to talk to infants. When we talk to infants, we use these kind of structures or these kind of mappings uh, and these kind of cues that we use or this kind of cues that we give uh, to the infants when talking, they provide the infant tools through which they are able to learn the syntax uh, of a particular, uh, the syntactic structure of a particular sentence. Now, international phase boundaries are not always followed by a uh, uh, a pause. Now, when we are talking to adult, in adults the international phase boundaries are not uh, the followed by a pause as, which is very true when we are talking to infants. So, we, we give pauses so the infant is able to understand where is the break. Uh, just as infants use transition probabilities, now the infants use something called transitional probabilities to detect word boundaries. Uh, they also use international phase boundaries to group words together and the use of prosodic patterns to identify syntactic structure is called prosodic bootstrapping. So, the infant use just as the infant use the, uh, the, the um, uh, transition probabilities to detect where the word has ended, any word would have ended. We have discussed this in words in how infants learn word. This is the same way the international phase boundaries are used by infants to detect um, syntactic structures of sentences. So, use of prosodic patterns to identify syntactic structure that is prosodic boost, uh, bootstrapping. Young children sensitivities to prosody and syntax, they grow together. Infants use pause to detect phase boundaries, 3 year old sensitives, uh, sensitive drops in pitch, pre boundary lengthening even without the pauses. Now, 2 year old children have the ability to use something called syntactic structures to infer meaning of words. Uh, and this is known as syntactic bootstrapping. So, infants generally use something called syntactic bootstrapping which is the use of syntactic information to make word meaning. So, uh, for example, what is the content word, what is the noun, what is the uh, verb and these kind of phase boundaries are used or this kind of uh, syntactic information are used by the infant to uh, get the meaning of the word which is being used in a sentence. Now, an example is that when 2 year olds, uh, they hear conversations about a, bo a boy mooping and they later prefer a scene of a person performing a novel act alone. But when they hear this sentence uh, that a boy is mooping a girl and later on they prefer sentences where which involves two people. And so, this gives us an idea that this kind of a syntactic bootstrapping is used by infants to generate infer word meaning.
now children at uh, uh, at the age of 2 also have the ability to use something called word meanings to make inferences about syntactic structures and this is called lexic uh, lexical bootstrapping so what is lexical bootstrapping it is uh, the ability uh, to use word meanings to make inferences about syntactic structures and, and this is generally used by the infants. So, use of word meanings to infer uh, the syntactic structure, knowledge of content word guides children's understanding of the function words. So, what is the function word and what is the content word? These kind of facts help the uh, infant deduce the syntactic structure of a sentence. So, between 2 and 3 years old vocabulary and sentence grow rapidly in tandem. Now, there is also something called uh, uh, mean length of utterance and mean length of utterance explains something about how sentences are uh, are uh, perceived by the infant. So, standard measure of children's syntactic uh, complexity is called the mean length of utterance. What is an utterance? An utterance has been defined as a continuous speech or speech boundary by pauses, but it need not be complete or grammatically co uh, uh, correct sequence. So, it, it is it has to be a continuous speech, but it not it may not be grammatically correct or in it no, it may not be syntactically correct. So, that is what an utterance is. Another interesting thing for infants is something called the number of different words uh, learned the NDW, which is common measure of child's productive vocabulary. So, this is how the children actually learn the syntactic structures. Also speech disruptions uh, give us an idea of how the infant uh, learns the uh, syntactic structure. For example, a stall which is a disruption of speech that does not change the syntactic structure of the utterance uh, and it consists of silences or fillers like oo and oom actually explain uh, the what is being, uh, uh, what process is being uh, uh, is, is, is being evaluated in sentence production. Now, stalls are believed to be the result of <coughs> crossing log jams in either the lexical retrieval or the phonological encoding as the child, child is incrementally building the sentences. So, this stall is explained in terms of uh, how, uh, how the lexical retrieval is happening or whether the phonological encoding or how the child would have uh, phonologically encoded, what kind of errors would have hap uh, happened in the phonological encoding. So, that is another uh, uh, factor which tells us how the infants is learning the sentence or sentence comprehension happens in infants. Now, how do, what are the various models of syntax acquisition? Now, there are several models of syntax acquisition. The first model of syntax acquisition is the generative approach uh, and which believes that syntax acquisition is driven by innate mechanisms. Now, uh, Chomsky, uh, Chomsky transitional, uh, transformational generative grammar is very popular uh, and that is the baseline for this kind of an approach. Now, Chomsky took the position that the linguistic input children receive is insufficient for them to learn the language and this is known as the poverty of stimulus argument. So, uh, Chomsky believes that the kind of linguistic input that the children is receiving from people around him is not enough for him to learn the language and that is called the poverty of the stimulus argument. Now, Chomsky views, uh, Chomsky views that adult speech is too full of errors, adults have make a lot of errors to be fit for a good model of learning. Adult speech is completely full of errors and so these errors uh, if, if the, these kind of speech errors are there, they may not be the right way <coughs> how uh, the child learns the sentences. So, what he uh, believes is he proposed something called uh, uh, the idea of the language equation device and so he says that mo most children have something called a language equation device which is a hypothetical module in the brain which is containing the universal set of grammars that guides development. Uh, language development. So, uh, Chomsky believes the, uh, the idea of the language equation device and this language equa uh, equation device is a hypothetical system which has its own grammatical principles and so they favor the development of language. Now, poverty of stimulus argument position that linguistic input receive is insufficient for them to learn the language. Why? Because the language that these children actually learn they learn from adults and adult speech is full of errors and so this this may not be the right word. So, what uh, Chomsky believes is there is something called a language equation device which is a hypothetical brain module containing the universal set of grammar rules and this guides the language framework. But then a number of researchers have actually opposed the Chomsky view and uh, uh, they uh, number of researchers they emphasize interactions between general cognitive abilities and a rich learning environment in childhood 
for the development of language. The uh, uh, this kind of usage based framework, psycholo uh, psychologists take the position that the child uses general cognitive mechanisms uh, like pattern detection and categorization to gradually build an understanding of the grammar of the language. So, basically there are no, the, the usage, usage based fr framework says that there are no inherent or uh, hypothetical brain module with language uh, uh, and grammar uh, built systems which help us in learning language. What the usage based statistics says that it is the position is that the child uses general cognitive mechanisms like pattern detection and categorization for making his own grammar and he gradually builds understanding of the grammar of the language. So, he uses these mechanisms based on these mechanisms he is able to produce sentences and this how the sentences are produced actually tells us how the grammar will be or the, uh, the child learns the grammar or syntax. So, basically the uh, U-shaped learning curve for plural and past tense inflections. At first, the children produce both regular and irregular verb forms, for example, walk, walk and uh, then later on the over generalization treating irregular words or irregular walk. Uh, walked and go go eventually they spot out the irregularity in irregular forms. So, child vocabulary and grammar develop through the second and third years and they exhibit a U shaped learning curve for plural and past tenses. At first they produces both the regular and irregular uh, inflection correctly as in walk walked and go uh, go went then they begin to use this over generalization. So, initially they use this kind of a generalization, but then they start using this for a longer uh, for longer sentences or they over generalize it uh, the phrase uh, characterized by by the treatment of irregular words as they were regularly inflicted. That is, they tend to say man's and foods uh, come and go. Even and this basically says this idea says that it is the um, usage based framework or it is the use of simple structures, cognitive uh, structures to build uh, to how the, the child learns grammar. Now, uh, the generative approach is basically of learning rules, whereas the uh, le learning based approach it uh, focuses on learning of patterns. So, learning approaches says that hypothetical system with rules understand make us understand the language, whereas the uh, uh, or sentence the syntax of a sentence, whereas the usage based framework says that patterns understanding patterns actually give us the ability to learn syntax. The generative approach views over generalization as the evidence for acquisition of a rule and collectivist network that is a computer program that models statistical learning exhibits both over generalization and U shaped learning curve when trained on plural and past tense inflection. So, basically the com com uh, connectivist network computer program that models statistical learning it exhibits a U shaped learning and uh, uh, generalization in children's learning of the syntax. So, there is a stronger evidence for the usage based network uh, framework comes from children's acquisition of uh, uh, another in inflection, the third person singular s suffix or verbs. Two year olds are more likely to use the s inflection when the verb is at the end of the utterance than when it is in the middle. So, uh, basically then acquisition of third person and that says that the structure building is an incremental process in in uh, in uh, the, the infants. So, basically two year old likely to say there he goes, but he go now difficult to reconcile with the rule based account and seems to be based on the ease of perception and production. Now, there is also something called correlation. So, uh, further evidences that incremental structure building happens or in incremental uh, syntax learning happen in children comes from the idea of correlation and what is correlation? Uh, 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 a sequence of words that frequently go together is called collation and these predictable phrases are likely uh, to be learned as chunks. So, sequences of words that frequently go together brush your teeth or three blind mice, young children will use these collations, but say tooths or mouses in other contexts. So, when we are saying this particular collation or this, sen uh, this sentence in this format, children will say teeth, but in all other sentences they will say Tooths. And so, this basically says that the learning is incremental in nature. Now, a premise of the poverty of stimulus argument in adult speech is filled with grammatical errors and incomplete sentences. Users based theorists do not disagree with the premise, but they argue that this supposedly fault input is a boon to language learning. So, poverty of the stimulus revisited usage based theorists view adult errors in incomplete sentences as a boon to language learning. English yes and no questions are complex. For example, is it training? Uh, is he training? Is he training? Can you see me? Can you see me? He wants to come? 
does he want to come that kind of a thing. So, a good example of this is the learning of yes and no structures which is quite common in English. The basic pattern involves inverting the subjects and auxiliary so that the statement it is raining becomes the question is it raining. So, if we invert the auxiliary it is raining which is a statement become is it raining which is now a question or you can see me becomes a question can you see me by just changing the auxiliary. And so, this gives us an idea of how uh, uh, this uh, poverty of stimulus argument does not stand. Ordinals often use reduced form for example, you want lunch to, to uh, even want your lunch as a statement and these this basically explain the, uh, the idea that, uh, that uh, the language equation device, the idea of language equation device does not explain how sentences are learned by infants or the syntax of a sentence are learned by infants. Now, non canonical forms are, strict, uh, are structurally simpler provide scaffolding for learning more complex structures. Primacy of meaning? So, basically children learn syntactic structures that are meaningful to them. For example, verbs important in driving development of uh, uh, in, uh, in driving de uh, develop the syntax of a uh, sentence. So, researchers working in the usage based framework emphasize that primacy of meaning in the development of a syntax. Children just do not learn patterns, uh, they learn syntactic structures that are meaningful to them. Verbs are especially important in driving the development of a syntax since it is the meaning that determines the structure of a sentence. Now, what kind of verbs can be learned? We have action verbs which teach canonical word order for example, the SVO in English and for example, mummy like flowers. We also can use mental state verbs for example, teach sentence embedding uh, I know mummy like flowers and so this kind of uh, 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 action verbs and mental state verbs are used and we can also use or pacifize is another area of language development where we see a complex interaction between a form and a meaning. Now, children's ability to understand and properly use the passive voice uh, develops slowly and it is not until around the 9 years of age that normally develop uh, normally developing children can reliably use the passive constructions correctly. The meaning covered by a particular passive sentence influences how likely it is the children will comprehend it correctly. For example, often interpret passive as active, the cat was chased by the dog was, the dog was chased by the cat. But this, uh, this is not how the, the a passive active interaction happens. Truncated, uh, the truncated passives, for example, the window was broken before full passive, for example, the window was broken by the boy. Now, uh, the passive construction poses a number of conceptual challenges for language users where the children are adults. One challenge is the strong tendency to equate subject with animate agents, especially for young children who is relying mostly on the meaning of the content word to understand the meaning of the syntactic structures. Such sentences are difficult to process and do not even begin to appear in children's speech until 7 or 8 years of age. Now, another uh, ch uh, challenge which is posed uh, uh, which uh, posed by passive construction is reversible sentences and so we have looked at reversible sentences so we will not be focusing on that. So, these are the some of the things that uh, explain how children learn what kind of errors happen in children's learning of the syntax. Now, there are several language impairments which are uh, there for a specific language uh, impairment SLI it is a difficulty using grammatical morphemes producing shorter and longer complex sentences he is going to the store or we play yesterday not due to cognitive or physical impairment. So, SLI, SLI is basically a developmental disorder which is characterized by difficulty in acquiring grammatical morphemes in the absence of other cognitive aspects. Now, because English inflections and function words are typically short and unstressed, there are some debate about what specific language impairment is truly a deficit of syntax in problem or perception. SLI is a perceptual deficit, children with SLI often produces inflections at the end of a sentences just not in the middle. For example, there he goes, but he go now. It is also important to distinguish specific language impairment from late language emergence which is a condition. So, what is late language emergence? It is a condition in which the children are initially delayed in language uh, development, but eventually catch up with their peers. So, children initially delayed in language development, but eventually catch up with their peers and contrast with SLI which contains into the lang uh, late childhood even adulthood. Now, uh, language development of the brain, let us look at a little bit about how language development happens in the brain. So, language development in childhood stem from changes in the brain structures uh, during the first year of life. So, developmental milestones, uh, year 1 statistical learning drives language development performed by auditory and association cortices in the temporal lobe. 
by year 2 and 3 development of syntax with heavy reliances on individual word meanings and ventral stream temporal to frontal subserves uh, the semantic uh, base syntax and from year uh, 7 to 9 the complex syntax such as passage and scrambling and dorsal stream parietal to uh, frontal matures. Language processing starts bilaterally gradually shifts to left hemisphere and the as the brain matures and so uh, looking at this the fmri uh, study of a 7 year old and adult and as you can see these are the maximum activations of different area so in all what we did today is we uh, looked at in today's lecture of how sentences are comprehended what are the various ways of how children learn uh, syntactic structures how syntactic structures are learned uh, some of the theories which explain how syntactic structures um, are, are uh, uh, extracted out of sentences by children and some form of how language disorders um, the certain kind of language disorders uh, happen in language so we looked at not only at uh, the uh, sen sentence production in the brain. We also looked at how syntax acquisition or uh, the, the idea of how syntaxes are extracted uh, from, uh, 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 from sentences happens in language in, in, in sentence processing not only for adults but also for uh, children. And we also looked at how the language developed in both in the adults and children. When we meet next we will take another interesting topic and venture into uh, that and till we do that meet again it is thank you and goodbye from here.